Thank you very much for your kind invitation to give this talk. It's a pleasure to be here. As Ricardo mentioned, I'm going to talk about electro and photoelectrochemical generation of the Fenton region, which is a region that we're using to do electrochemical wastewater treatment. So uh, let me start by telling you that I'm working at CDETEC. That's an electrochemical research lab. There we do stuff that goes from basic research, which research goes down to TRL1 to uh, engineering processes. What I'm going to talk about in the group that I belong to is in the is work related to level two or three more or less, which are basic ideas to develop technology in water treatment. Uh, we work with advanced oxidation processes. That is a process that is characterized by the generation and use of hydroxyl radicals. These radicals, as you can see that table, are very strong, very powerful oxidants. They, it is in that table right below fluorine and above hydrogen peroxide, permanganate, and another well-known oxidant species. There are many ways to generate the hydroxy radical, and one of them is the Fenton reagent. The Fenton reagent is the combination of hydrogen peroxide and iron to a species in aqueous medium, and as you can see in that uh, image there, you generate the hydroxy radical and you generate iron three species the radical, the hydroxy radical, it goes ahead and oxidizes any pollutant that it finds in water. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. The Fenton reagent has several advantages. As I mentioned, uh, it, it has a high oxidation power. It's non-specific, so anything that it finds, it oxidizes pretty fast is suitable for contaminating microorganisms, and is also suitable for effluents with pollutants that are toxic towards microorganisms that usually are employed in biological treatments. As everything else in life, it also has some disadvantages, and among those, you can find that in the Fenton uh, reaction, iron must be, iron, iron is included, and therefore iron must be separated and the acid neutralized in a later stage that increases the cost of the process. The acidic conditions are required for this reaction to take place. A careful concentration control of the iron and hydrogen peroxide species is required. And hydrogen peroxide solutions are expensive, are difficult to handle, and in some cases are even dangerous. So when you compare that, and this obviously is not uh, an exhaustive uh, table is just as an example. When you compare that to the regular biological process or a physical chemistry process, it, you can find that the Fenton reagent approach is not safe and its operation costs are high. It has some advantages. It requires a, a small space, little space. It has a high oxidation power and the duration times are fast. But having these two not safe and the operation costs high, this, this prevents the Fenton technology to be uh, developed and used commonly. So there is an approach with electrochemistry in which hydrogen peroxide can be generated in situ by uh, the two electron reduction of oxygen in solution using carbon electrodes, carbon cathodes. You can see here that for this reaction to take place, we also need a relatively acidic medium and we also need iron to be in solution so that the reaction takes place. In the anodic part, if we assist this process with um, light, with UV light, and let's say we use a titanium dioxide anode, we can generate uh, charge carriers, electrons and holes. The holes can oxidize water and, and produce more hydroxy radicals. And the UV light could be used to regenerate the iron to go from iron 3 to iron 2, or to uh, decompose hydrogen peroxide into hydroxy radicals. So this is the photosystem uh, electrophenton reaction. What we, uh, the first reactor that we uh, built on to test these this, uh, ideas was a reactor with two concentric tubes, two concentric cylinders. In the inner one, we had a UV lamp. We have this covered with a titanium dioxide layer. We have a carbon cloth in the, in the other cylinder. And we have the water that we wanted to to treat in, in which we wanted to generate hydrogen peroxide flowing between the two electrodes. As you can see here in this, in this curve, we 
found out that hydrogen peroxide begins, in concentration begins to increase. Eventually, it reaches a point in which the concentration stays constant because uh, hydrogen peroxide is being built on the surface of the electrode and then electrons keep going and reducing further the hydrogen peroxide and we got a, a, a limiting concentration of hydrogen peroxide. So we prepared a reactor in which we have uh, the, the, the solvent, the electrolytic solution flowing through the electrodes. We use a carbon cloth cathode and an anode, which is also a carbon cloth coated with titanium dioxide, the UV lamp here. And with this, we were removing the hydrogen peroxide that was, that was being prepared on the surface of the cathode or the electrochemically generated species. And as you can see here, for, our, for an orange 2 degradation experiment in which we were measuring the absorbance at time t, uh, in ratio with the absorbance at time zero, we could see that when we use only anodic oxidation, that is electricity or photoelectrooxidation, we see this degradation curve for the, for the dye solution. When we add iron to the solution, we have the Fenton, the electrophenton uh, reaction, and when we assist that with, uh, with uh, UV light, we have a faster kinetics in the photoelectrophenton approach. So, uh, for that, we, okay, we had a, a, a first reactor and, and we found the problem that the UV light that we were incorporating into the system had to go through the solution, had to go through the walls of the reactor. So we uh, did a project in which we were using an opti optic fiber uh, TO2 based photoanode. The, we were thinking, this is a very simplistic idea, but we were thinking on the optic fiber as a sort of light hose in which you have light going through the, through, the, through the fiber. And if it is a silicon oxide optic fiber and we treated that with hydrofluoric acid, we could change, we could sort of make, make holes. It's not actually holes. We were like changing the refraction index of the material and light could be escaping along the fiber. And then we would cover that with titanium dioxide so that we could have a activation of that coating but from the inner part of the, of the fiber, not illuminating from the exterior, but from the interior of the electrode. And we could also have some UV light escaping to regenerate the iron for the electrophenton reaction. Uh, here you can see that we were measuring the number of coatings of titanium dioxide. We found that after five coatings, we have the maximum production of hydrogen peroxide, either illuminating from the internal part or the external part and we did experiments here not measuring the absorbance but the total organic carbon concentration of a dye and we could see again a comparison of anodic electrooxidation the electroassisted photocatalytic oxidation external illumination or internal illumination this is electrophenton and we could observe that the best kinetics was obtained for the internal illumination with the, our optic fiber it, the other thing that was important besides having the hydrogen peroxide being generated in the cathode or, or photoassisting in the anode the, the production of hydrogen peroxide was the iron. Iron must be provided to the solution and later removed. And there was a work by Kiwi and co-workers who used an affion membrane to hold iron ions into the membrane and then do a Fenton reaction. So what we basically did is that we incorporated in this reactor that I showed you before, a resin, an ion exchange resin, and this resin would capture and have an equilibrium liberating the iron to ions, and, and we wanted to see if that would avoid the requirement to have iron in solution. So as you can see here, we compared experiments in which nafion membrane was loaded with iron or uh, an ion exchange resin, and we obtained similar results. This is a table of the cost. The nafion is far more expensive than the membranes that we employed, and we could obtain a, a good, a good a, a process for a removal of a dye. So with these ideas in mind, we went on and, and and did some uh, preliminary applications. Uh, the first one is related to the carbon electrode. If we need a large surface carbon electrode that could act not only as an electrode, but also as an adsorbent, we needed a conductive, well-packed, activated carbon column that could be used as this electrode. Let's say that we have particles, particles that could be carbon as we buy it, or oxidized carbon, which was previously treated with acid, 
and we were measuring what the density was in order to obtain a good conductivity and have this like a sort of a 3D electrode. So we compared uh, these two types of carbon, the carbon that we just bought and the carbon that we previously treated with acid in order to oxidize it. We changed the, the density by changing the, the height of this, of this um, uh, cylinder. We measured the electrical conductivity of that and we obtained that after 0.5 grams per square per cubic centimeter, we were obtaining the, the, a good conductivity, a good electrical conductivity. We tested that in terms of the generation of hydrogen peroxide in these activated uh, carbon columns. And then we went ahead and tried to do this as a process to regenerate activated carbon. As you know, activated carbon is the most popular adsorbent uh, and it's, it's being used in small packages or in huge packages. We, you, you could use a few grams or tons of that in different processes. And after a while, the activated carbon gets saturated by the contaminant. After that, it has to be regenerated. That means it has to be cleaned up, and then you can reuse it. It is reported that usually you can reduce it about 10 times before throwing it away because it's, it's already uh, wasted. So, um, of course, this is not the case for the, for the very small applications, but there is one, sorry. So, uh, there is a couple of regeneration technologies that are, that are being used. One is thermal treatment, which is basically sublimation of the contaminant. The other one is solvent extraction. When, they, when uh, is, there are large amounts of activated carbon, usually it has to be uh, taken out to a regeneration plant. And uh, as you can see here, both technologies are, have high operation costs. They need contaminant replacement. They have high products, and they are not safe. What we're proposing as a regeneration scheme in using these ideas is to have an activated carbon particle mixed with a resin loaded with protons and uh, iron 2. So iron 2 should be in equilibrium here. And if we uh, use the activated carbon as an electron, as an electrode, sorry, we could uh, reduce in a two electron process oxygen in solution, produce hydrogen peroxide, which in, in mixed with this iron 2 is already the Fenton reagent, so it could produce hydroxy radicals, and these hydroxy radicals could clean up the activated carbon contaminant that has been absorbed. In this case, we were using toluene. In order to test uh, these ideas, what we did is that we prepared an activated carbon paste electrode, and for that, we measured the oxygen reduction reaction. We titrated that with toluene, and we would be seeing how the, the current, the oxygen reduction associated current was decreasing as the concentration of toluene increased. We could actually calculate how much toluene we had to add to have about 80% of the surface of the activated carbon covered with toluene. And then we did experiments uh, as this. As you can see here, first we had the uh, oxygen reduction reaction in, in clean activated carbon. Then we covered 80% of the surface with a certain amount of toluene, and then we polarized in the presence of oxygen and generated hydrogen peroxide and see how that changes, how the surface of the activated carbon is regenerated if that happens. Uh, that difference is this, this value, uh, the ratio between this value, this is the regeneration, but this beta, this change in the current, as opposed to the original change in the current when we covered the solution of activate, the surface of activated car, uh, carbon with toluene. So this is the response that we obtained with activated carbon only. And when we add to the solution iron, then we have Fenton reagent and we have a far better recovery uh, ratio, as you can see here. And when we use not iron in solution, but our mixture of activated carbon and the resin loaded with iron, uh, we observe pretty much the same recovery that you could see in this case here. We went ahead and put that into a reactor. So in this reactor, what we're doing is that we're passing solution. Here we have a mixture of activated carbon and the resin uh, loaded with, uh, with this iron. And we added toluene additions, and we followed the concentration of toluene 
30 minutes between each measurements after the process of adsorption and polarization takes place. Here are the results of those experiments. As you can see here in the black, with these black squares, we have the first three additions. We don't see any concentration of toluene. That's only the absorption of toluene in the activated carbon. But after that, it is saturated, and you begin to see how the concentration of toluene increases as the number of, the, uh, of additions uh, do. Then we polarize in the presence of nitrogen or in the presence of oxygen. You see one more uh, addition, but eventually you see exactly the same behavior. You begin to see again the concentration of toluene going up. And when we add iron to the system, either in solution or in the resin, you don't see toluene at all in any of these additions. We also measured the total organic carbon um, in these experiments as the number of additions. We never observed more than 20 parts per million, and one addition of toluene accounted for, for uh, 10 times that, about 221 parts per million. So uh, not only that, but we could also see how the regeneration efficiency of this activated carbon was pretty good. We, after 10 cycles of treatment, we only lost 7% of the absorption capacity. And then we were wondering how or why this, this uh, regeneration was not damaging the activated carbon. And we did experiments in which we compared the thermal treatment, the solvent extraction process, a, a process in, in which we use a fenton, use, use the fenton to oxidize the carbon and the electrochemical or electrophenton process. We compared the regeneration of the activated carbon in these four scenarios, and we found out that for our system, uh, or the, the percentage of color removal or the talc removal for all the other three processes fell uh, faster than in our case, because actually that's what the conclusion here was. There was a cathodic, or we believe, there was a cathodic protection effect on the activated carbon because we're polarizing as a, as, an, as a cathode. And then we are preventing oxidation in the, in the strong oxidation environment that the fenton reagent imposes on the surface of the material. So the idea, what we're looking for, is a technology that is safe, that has smaller operation costs, that doesn't need container replacement so that you can apply this, this regeneration process in situ and doesn't re, uh, cre uh, produce byproducts. Uh, the other thing is that, as I mentioned before, for this electrophenton reaction to take place, you need acid, you need iron, as I mentioned, and we are um, proposing this type of reactor. Here, this is a representation of water, and these uh, circles are any pollutant. We have a resin here, a compartment with a resin here that has iron and protons. So as the process uh, starts up, uh, the material here is washed out and got into the, into the packed activated carbon compartment. Here, by virtue of the polarization, we can have the electrophenton conditions because we have iron and we have acid here. So the, uh, the pollutant gets oxidized. And after that, uh, there is another resin here that can capture the iron and the protons giving rise to clean water. So you don't need to, to have iron here or an acidic condition. And obviously, on time, uh, everything will, will be washed out. So the idea is that if we have a find, uh, we, if we find a time, T1, in which we switch the process, what we could have here is now going in the opposite direction. Now we can wash this part here, go back, uh, and still use the iron and the protons inside and capture them here. And then you could have a process in which you don't have to add either the iron or the acid because it's all the time inside the reactor. The idea, of course, or the, or the goal here, of course, is to find this T1, and, and the inverse of that would be the frequency in which we, we would be changing or switching the flow direction and the polarity of the reactor. So the experiments that we did for that were transport experiments. We were just measuring how protons or iron go across the first compartment, two compartments, the resin and the carbon, on the three compartments, resin, carbon, and resin. And we could be finding out which is the time in which we could be doing the, the switching 
so that iron and protons are all the time within the reactor. That, that would be the goal. And as you can see here, using a, an iron-free dye solution, a neutral iron-free dye solution, we could see that when we use a non-polarized uh, reactor and, and not, not switching the flow direction, you could see how uh, the absorbance of this dye solution begins, well, it doesn't grow that much because first it's only absorption and then it begins to grow very fast. Here you can see when we have inversion flow, which is kind of similar, we're just changing the flow direction, but we are not polarizing. There is no electrophenton reactions taking place here. Here, the blue one, is, this is the zone in which the electrophenton reaction is taking place. Eventually, uh, the iron and the acid species are flushed out, and then it begins to grow again. And when we are switching uh, either both, sorry, the polarization and the flow direction, we see a better behavior in terms of discoloration of the, of the solution. So, uh, as, as Ricardo mentioned, we were here uh, in this Congress. We, we, we were lucky enough to get a, a, a grant from the Valen Melinda Gates Foundation and the Electrochemical Society to try to test these ideas for the in situ electrochemical generation of the Fenton region for the treatment of human wastewater. So this is a particular kind of water that, that we wanted to try with this. You all know that um, there is a lot of research on processes to improve the processes in water plants, but uh, in order to have that, you need a, a transportation facilities to take it from the production or the site where the production of the human waste uh, takes place to the treatment plants, and there is, 20, 2,600 million people worldwide that doesn't have access to these, to these facilities. And actually in Mexico, 9 million people still lack sanitation services. So it's a, it's a, it's a large amount of people here in Mexico. Uh, Mexico uh, CONACID, which is the Mexican Council for Science and Technology, also uh, gave us some money for, for this grant. In order to try to build up a, a bath, a, a toilet, sorry, no, it's not a bath, I'm translating, it's a toilet. Um, uh, so it has a solid liquid separator. The solid goes to a biological solid treatment. And the idea here is that the liquid goes to this electrophenton reactor that could be powered by a, by, by a solar cell. Uh, the important part of this, of this reactor is that it could treat these this, this microorganisms, which in particular are helming OVA. These, these uh, microorganisms, as you can see here, can be treated with a hypochlorite, but not very effectively. Uh, fenton, the fenton treatment is far better because, as I mentioned before, the, the hydroxyl radical is, is a more powerful oxidant. And here, actually, you can see how uh, for the fenton reagent, after some time, uh, some time the membrane is destroyed and all the uh, material inside the egg uh, leaks out and is destroyed. Uh, now the thing is, if we were generating those conditions inside this reactor. Here you can see um, some uh, micrographs of the helmet uh, eggs uh, in the electrode or in the cathode material before and after the electrophenton uh, reaction took place. And actually, in order to test that, we collaborated with, with a group in the, at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. They, they measured this, this uh, helmet OVA. Uh, and here you can see different conditions for this reactor and how the results went out. We had one liter of this solution with about 200 helmet X. This is the flow rate, the temperature, and the pH. And then we were going through this reactor just in one direction. This is, this is experiment one, or one of these three experiments. You could see that the inactivation is, is very low when you only have adsorption. When we have electrooxidation and when we have electrophenton, the percentage of helmet egg inactivation increases. When we use this cycling um, scheme here, we see 37%, uh, 80%. Here, suspended solids, we added a pet food in, in the solution to try to simulate some other things that could come in water that looks closer to human wastewater, and uh, the last experiment in which we have the 
switching in, uh, polarization inversion scheme, we have 100% of inactivation of the helmet OVA due to the electrophenton process. And the idea is this hydroxyl radical destroys, as I mentioned, the membrane, and here you can see some pictures of the damaged helmet, helmet OVA. So what we're after uh, is, I'm, I'm comparing this, this table I showed you a few minutes ago in, at the beginning of the presentation. What we're looking is something that is safe, uh, that operation costs are not very high. We're not using expensive catalysts. We're using carbon. We're using titanium dioxide. We're using uh, solar light. That requires a small space. The oxidation power is high because it's, it's the hydroxyl radical, is the electrophenton approach, and that the degradation times are fast. I, we, uh, we are working different approaches for that. For example, we have this, these reactors are in this little uh, floating device here that has some uh, helixes. You say helixes here, so the water is going through uh, the reactor and is moving. It's powered by a solar cell or a generation reactor. And this is a scheme of the toilet that we'll be building up in our institution. Uh, as this, is, this is only the, well, there, there's a pit down here where all this stuff is, all the working. Uh, pieces of equipment are. I really want to thank the opportunity to come here to talk to you about our research, uh, to Electrochemical Society, Sociedad Mexicana de Electroquímica, to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Conacyt, who have financed the, the research that I'm presenting today. This is our institution, and obviously, and more important, the people that have done all the experiments that I showed you uh, today, and that I'm very grateful to them. And thank you very much for your...